and I'm here to talk to you about a project I've been working on for a long time called Tulip. Um, and it's a little bit embarrassing uh, <laughs> to come up here and talk to you about, here's this programming language that I designed and I'm making, and you should use it. Um, because if I'm honest, most programming language projects fail. Um, and the reason that they fail is a number of things, but a big part of it is that they're just really big projects that have a lot of things that you can get wrong. Um, and uh, also, as a community, we still haven't figured out what we're doing and how to make languages yet. Um, but I have a really good feeling about this one. Um, and I'm hoping that by the end of this talk that you will also have a really good feeling about this one. Um, I think this is uh, exactly the direction that, that, uh, that we need to go today. So why do I have a good feeling about it? Um, first of all, uh, in the previous talk, someone mentioned about um, bootstrapping for as long as possible. I've been working on this for four years, maybe five. I, I lose count sometimes. Um, Every feature that I talk to you about today, I could talk your ear off for hours about all the trade-offs involved and the various ways that it's been historically. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, researching prior art, learning a lot of different languages, stealing features from a lot of places, just as the uh, talk um, this morning mentioned that Clojure steals uh, features. Tulip is also stealing features. Um, Tulip ships with batteries included, and this is, this is part of Tulip's philosophy. There's a lot of uh, languages out there that, that are um, old and new that are shipping with this sort of idea that they're going to give you this tiny little core out of which you can implement anything. Um, and Tulip is specifically not doing that. Um, Tulip is here to make your life easier. Um, if there, and, and, there are, and recognizes that there's a set of language features that can't be libraries like concurrency, like late binding, like tail calls, um, pattern matching and variance, and, um, and various other abstraction tools. The trade-off here is that we have a lot of features. So uh, I have a lot of content to cover today. We're going to cover most of what Tulip offers, um, although there's, there's still going to be a wide swath that I'm not going to be able to get to. Um, another reason that I feel good about this language is that we recognize that in order to build and put a language out there, you have to start with a community. Tulip is, <laughs> thank you. Um, Tulip is one of the languages to come out of uh, the sort of language design community called SNEC that, that I started um, in, in around September or October. Um, it's a sort of bubble of culture within uh, FP and language design that, um, that I'm kind of trying to cultivate. Um, it's just a Slack network, um, so it's not a whole, it's not a, that complicated, but um, we're, we're trying to make something positive and make a, make a community out of which we can build languages and that can become language communities later. Tulip is also unapologetically femme. Um, if you are a straight man, you might uh, feel programming Tulip uh, slightly afraid that it would make you gay. <laughs> This is intentional, um, despite that being not how gay works. Uh, <laughs> this is this is this is the this is the feeling that I would like to. Uh, so, if you are programming Tulip, Tulip is named after a very pretty flower uh, that I like a lot because it's pretty. Um, we have a, a wonderful logo designed by my partner Allison, and um, it's it's all intended to be sort of you will be surrounded by rainbows and unicorns and ponies, and that's just sort of how it is. Um, our core team, uh, so far there's uh, three of us. Um, there's me, I'm writing the, I did most of the design, I'm writing the compiler front end. There's Sig, who is here in the audience, um, who is uh, just, um, has, has put together an incredible uh, runtime architecture that I don't understand all of it, um, and is writing the back end, including GC and concurrency um, primitives. And Lexi Lambda, who you may have heard of from the Racket community, who's helping us out a lot with the macro um, system and also making an exploratory implementation in Racket so we can kind of um, smoke out issues that might come up. Um, finally, the reason I feel really good about Tulip and one of the major niches I think it's going to fill is that we have eliminated nil in a dynamic programming language. And those of you who are familiar with um, programming in Haskell or ML, 
um, or even Erlang uh, are used to programming without nil. Um, but for the rest of us, this might come as, as kind of a surprise. So I'll get into that a little bit later. So this is what we're going to do today. I'm going to show you some pretty pictures of what Tulip looks like. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to do a sort of lightning fast tour of the core language. I'm going to talk about nil and Tulip's relationship with nil. Um, and then we're going to continue the tour and talk about tools for abstraction, for code abstraction. And then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about the runtime. All right. So start with pretty pictures. Um, this is a, a tulip sample of a piece of code that implements a mutable ref, so uh, using sort of an Erlang style um, looping server to manage the state. Um, and on the other hand, this is a module that uh, constructs a lazy list of all prime numbers. So um, we can we can go from very mutative kind of semantics to very kind of functional semantics, and it all sort of works naturally together. All right, so the core language. Tulip is an untyped checked language. Um, there's no type checker. Um, I could talk for a very long time about why I made that choice. Tulip was typed for a very long time, and then uh, we sort of dropped that feature. Um, you will find, if you're used to typed languages, that you are able to program in Tulip the same way that you normally do in typed languages. Um, and you get a, a large fraction of the benefit from that. Um, it's a mutation discouraged language, similar to Erlang or Clojure or, um, or Racket. Uh, so you can have refs. You can do side effects. Um, we, we are impure, um, but the uh, all of, but you can't do things like rebind variables. Mutation is very um, contained, and you have to do it explicitly. Uh, we're garbage collected and also jitted. Um, no manual memory management. Um, it's what I call homoiconic enough in that uh, <laughs> I could give a whole talk about this, uh, about why Tulip is not a Lisp, um, although people might argue that it kind of is. Um, it's home iconic enough in that the, um, the syntax is representable at runtime in a data structure that is easy to manipulate, in, in particular in the context of macros. And I'll get to that in more detail later. And finally, it's got pattern matching and guards built in at the very core. Um, and I'll get to what that looks like in a minute. OK, so a variable name looks like this. We use dashes and variable names. They look pretty. Uh, and they're easy to type. This is a basic expression. Here we're multiplying 4 and 5 and then adding 3 to it to get 23. Nothing here surprising. This is actually valid Haskell syntax. So nothing, nothing here that's particularly unique. Um, the, we add one more th a way to apply functions, though. Um, and that, oh, sorry. First of all, you'll notice that uh, I'm using the word add and the word mole to do math. So the first thing I want to point out is that we have no infix math. Um, all user functions are identifiers. And the reason for that is twofold. One is that I wanted to reserve the, the symbols for other language features. Uh, and the other is most of the time when you're doing math, you're doing it on, on kind of a higher order way. Um, and it's more convenient to have functions that act exactly the same as every other function in your language rather than having to do syntax backflips to, to have different uh, infixity properties and, and so on. So all user functions are prefixed. There's no infix operators in Tulip, except for one. And it's a very important one. Um, and we pronounce it, uh, I pronounce it into. Old Unix hands might pronounce it gazinta, as in this gazinta that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> And so you'll notice when I explained what the first line did, I said we multiply 4 and 5 and then add 3. Um, and, and with this kind of syntax, you get to actually just write it that way. Here we're multiplying 4 and 5, and then we're adding 3, and then we're printing it. Right? Um, multiply 4 and 5 into add 3 into print. Yes? So it allows you to sort of linearly compose functions uh, with, um, in, in, in the order of value, function, 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 function. Cool? And a lot of languages are shipping with these features now, um, but they usually use pipe greater than, 
which every time I type it, my wrist kind of gives me a little, a little twinge. Um, so we're just using one symbol, and it's very easy to type. Um, and this makes programming on the REPL very, very simple. Uh, there's, you don't have to have any foresight to know that you're going to chain stuff. There should be, part of the design philosophy is there should be no point at which you're typing on a REPL and uh, need to scan back to do something. Or at least that should be very rare. Uh, of course, we have uh, first class functions. This is a lambda. Lambdas are represented with square brackets and arrows. Um, here we're mapping a function that adds three to a thing over a vector. And here's a vector literal, and I'll explain more what that is in a second. Um, we can do a little bit better here by doing two things. One is flipping the, the order. So you start with the data, and then you do something to it using the, the into operator. And second, we, we have a quick lambda with, so there's no arrow, and you just sort of use dollar sign as the, as the argument. Um, and actually, Tulip has a feature that will be familiar if you've used Haskell or ML, which is called auto curry. So if you provide a function like add, which accepts two arguments, um, fewer than ex expected number of arguments, um, it'll just give you a curried function. So currying is sort of built in. So in this case, we can just send the function add three into the other function that will do something with it. Um, we've got some fun literals. We've got traditional double-quoted strings. Uh, we've got a slightly more convenient way to represent strings with just a single quote, um, which is a lot more convenient on a REPL. We've got tuples. We've got regexes. We've got vectors. We've got maps. Um, and I'll explain more about what that syntax on the bottom is later. Hint, it's macros. Um, blocks in Tulip are delimited by curlies. And they're a way of doing two things. One is you can use them to define variables and use them later. Um, another is you can use them to chain side effects together. And of course, Tulip is an impure language, so we have side effects. Um, and you can use uh, a block to have multiple side effects. Um, you'll notice here I'm using a semicolon. And back here, I used a new line. Semicolon and new line are exactly equivalent at the lexer level. So um, anything you can do in a file, you can do on, on a single line in the REPL, you know, up to practicality. Um, there's no indentation sensitivity or white space sensitivity or anything like that. Um, ML syntax has a slight weakness for zero argument functions, which we've uh, patched by introducing this bang notation, where if you have a zero argument function for something that only does a side effect and takes no arguments, um, you can think of bang as a formal symbol that uh, acts like an, a ghost argument to a function. Um, so if you just said start sprinklers without the bang, it would just be the function itself that hasn't done any side effects yet. And as soon as you call it with a bang, it um, it does the side effect. And the reason for this is zero argument functions are inherently side effectful, right? Um, otherwise, you would just use a value. Um, of course, we also have zero argument lambdas. Um, and this particular pattern of a zero argument lambda that uses a block to do multiple things is so common that we also have this syntax for block lambdas, where you only get one clause, um, but you can do multiple things within the lambda. Uh, and of course, we'll ship with uh, fun stuff to do mutation with uh, in ways that are sort of clearly marked visually that you are doing mutation now. Um, we'll also ship with refs, which are similar to Clojure's atoms um, that sort of support arbitrary um, atomic operations out of the box with the modify function. Um, so you modify a ref with a function. Uh, and the result here is wrong. That should be three, right? But you, you get the idea. OK, so tag words. Tag words are one of the core, core features of Tulip that I think um, makes, it, makes it very unique. Um, a tag word by itself is just an identifier with a dot. And by itself, it just acts as sort of a symbol. Um, if you say to print this, it will print literally dot some word. But they have this sort of magical power where you can use them to construct data structures. You can add values to them. Um, so here we have a data structure that is a tag and two values. Um, its tag is some word, and it's got two values in it. Um, and you can use this sort of recursively to make trees. 
Um, you can use this uh, to make your own fancy data structures with whatever identifiers you want to tag what they are. And of course, you can pattern match against them later uh, in the square bracket lambdas. Uh, and the, the first pattern that matches the argument will be, will be executed with the, the uh, pattern match variables bound. Um, if this looks familiar, I've given a whole talk about this. This is a pattern called variance. In Tulip, we call them tag words because it's easier to explain to beginners what they are, um, which is a, a very key uh, thing that we're doing. Um, and, and these tag words aren't just sort of a feature that is sort of tacked on. These are baked into the, to the very core of the language. Um, oh, sorry. One other thing is you can, you can have guards on these pattern matches, so, um, so conditions at, on which, the pattern, which have to pass in order for the pattern to match. And else here is just a variable that is true. Um, they're baked so far into the language that Booleans are just tags. They're the tag words TNF. And if you want to do a, a sort of plain if, uh, you can just branch on true and false. Um, it's not intended that this pattern is going to be, like if is not a thing that you do a whole lot in Tulip. Um, there is no if statement. Um, instead, because when you have pattern matches and guards, it doesn't really come up that much. You branch using patterns, you branch using guards. Um, and that's sort of the, the way that you program. You can also use tag words to implement optional values with some and none. Um, and we also use tag words to implement cons lists. Uh, if you're familiar with the way that cons lists work in Haskell, this is exactly the same. Um, it's just untyped. And these are just identifiers. They're symbols that mark what a thing is. Of course, we have a macro that makes this easier, uh, the list macro. And now here's the part where I told you there was no nil, and you see nil clearly on the screen as well as none. Um, <laughs> so I'm going I'm to back up and explain what I mean by that. So let's talk about nil. We have a, we have a null problem in our industry. Um, this is my friend Aleel, who goes by Queer Types on Twitter, who describes herself as a null wrangler as, as, her, as her job description, because that's what she does all day. And uh, who here feels the same way? Like, you go to work, and you, like, you spend all day chasing down nil, <laughs> right? Um, Clojure has this problem real bad. Um, I, I think still on my, on my computer here, if I open up a line REPL, I will get a giant NPE uh, before it shows me the, <laughs> the REPL, because I've configured something wrong. But can't figure out what it is, because it's just an NPE. Um, why the Lucky Stiff famously deleted all of his internet accounts and quit programming forever, and later wrote that uh, one of the big reasons he did was because he was so sick of fighting Null. And then uh, Tony Hoare, who can be said to have implemented, uh, to have invented Null in, uh, in Algo 65, um, called it his billion dollar mistake and has a whole hour long talk about um, the, the various things that led to this mistake and the, the consequences thereof. So we know nil is bad. We know nil is hard to deal with. Uh, it causes us a lot of pain in our daily programming lives. But when we are faced with a language that doesn't have null, we kind of forget how to program without it. Um, this is a question that is you know, one of, a representative one of about 10,000 questions on the Erlang questions mailing list, Erlang being another language that doesn't have null, um, but instead has pattern matches and guards. Where someone comes in to Erlang trying to code in their normal way, and they're like, where is null? I need null. <laughs> and the answer here should scare you a little bit. <laughs> right? um, this, the, the person who responded said um, that they use undefined none, null, and nil <laughs> in different situations. Um, and, uh, and I'm actually going to tell you that this is a good thing. Um, and, and I, know, I know this is maybe hard to believe, but this is actually a good thing if we have some conventions. So let's step back and ask, what do we use nil or null or none for in, in languages? Um, well, it can represent the empty list in like a lisp. It's sort of the null pointer at the end of a, of a linked list, right? It can be the return value of a function that is just for a side effect and doesn't have any data to, 
to return. It's sometimes used for non-crashing errors. Uh, Ruby's string searches do this. If you, if you try to search for something in a string and it's not found, it'll just return nil as an indication that it wasn't found. It's used for empty optional values. Um, so values that might not be there um, will sometimes just randomly be null. And it's also used for uninitialized record fields. So you're, you're making a record, and then some muta mutative process is going to come along and fill those with data later. Um, this space is way too big to use one thing for, right? All of these things are very different semantically, right? And in, so in Tulip, we, we have different names for all of them, right? The empty list is .nil, following, following Haskell and, um, and Lisp. Uh, a successful side effect will say, OK, right? Do this thing, OK, <laughs> right? Um, Non-crashing errors will say it's an error, <laughs> right? And give you the reason. Um, optional values, we use none. Uh, and for uninitialized record fields, we can use undefined or undef. Um, but I want to back up and say that there's, there's one more thing about this that's, that's important. Uh, if we look at none, it's not just none, right? It's not just that we tag the missing one with none. It's that the present one also has a tag that you have to check, right? The, the key here is the, is the sum tag. Because you can't just have a value and go use it and run your tests and they pass, and then suddenly it's none, right? In order to get at the value, you have to grapple with the fact that it's wrapped in sum, which gives you a hint that you should probably check the none case as well. And of course, the syntax uh, encourages you to do that, because there's already a place for it to go. And I would say uh, uninitialized record fields are kind of an anti-pattern in Tulip. Um, I go into this a lot more in the, in the variance talk that I gave a couple years ago. Um, but 99% of the time, you shouldn't need to have uninitialized record fields. And you should be able to factor them out. Every once in a while, it's going to be necessary, so you can still do it. But you're using undef as a sort of indication that you're doing something dangerous. I'm going to stop and do a slight side eye at Elixir here. Elixir is a wonderful language that has a lot of amazing features and innovations. But they took Erlang and reintroduced nil. Um, and and I, I am really sad about this fact. Um, so in Tulip, we are not making this mistake. We, there is no nil. Uh, instead, you're encouraged to use uh, pattern matching and, uh, and guards to, to manage your, your data and, and to wrap the success cases the same as, as, you, as you tag the, the, the sad cases. Um, OK. A very common way to want to abstract things in, in programming is I have implemented an interface, and you can go implement your own data structure and implement this interface on it. This is the expression problem. And in Tulip, we just sort of directly give that to you. We have open methods. Um, they're named. Um, what's happening here is the syntax at the top says that map is an open method that has, takes two arguments, and we branch off of the second one. So we ignore the first one with that underscore. We branch off the second one. And then we're implementing map on lists. We're implementing map on, uh, on optionals to, to do your, your sort of normal optional mapping. Uh, and then you can go and implement map on whatever thing that you want later, right? Um, so this is, this is a, the way that Tulip solves the expression problem. We got modules, which are more or less just namespaces, um, which is a key feature that you need <laughs> in a language. You need to be able to namespace stuff. Um, and you look it up with slash, just like Clojure. Objects. So, Tulip objects, so th there's a pattern in object-oriented programming that uh, has been talked about a lot and hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention recently. But um, it's, it's a way of doing functional programming in OO languages where you treat your object not as a bundling of state and, and functionality, which is sort of the traditional OO way of doing it, but as a bundling of data and functionality. And, and thinking of the methods on an object as a bunch of plain functions that have some data closured in to them um, that are sort of a collection of functions that share a, a common closure. And in Tulip, this is exactly what objects are. I like this pattern so much, I just decided that this is, this is what objects are. Objects are modules with a closure. 
um, they're a collection of functions that have things in their closure. So here we have a point object, um, and it has two things in its closure, the x and the y coordinates. And we have two functions, magnitude and move. Now magnitude you can think of as a function that takes an x and y and returns a number. But once we've instantiated an object, um, that function has gotten all of its arguments. So just like a curried function, it executes, right? And it gets stored in the object, and we can just look it up. Magnitude is a function that takes four arguments, x, y, dx, and dy. And when you instantiate the object, it gets the x and y curried in, so now it becomes a function that takes two arguments. And in fact, if you just look up magnitude on the point, uh, on the point um, object itself, rather than the instance, uh, you'll get a function that takes two arguments. It's just right there. Um, and you can partially apply it. You can partially apply it and then look stuff up. Um, and this is, uh, in, in my opinion and experience, uh, a very um, positive way to use OO for things like late binding, um, to, to think of them as, as sort of closures um, that are contained with, with each other. We got macros, um, which you've seen. We had list macros, we had vector macros. Um, the, uh, the way macros work in Tulip is they're, they're based on sort of three different macro systems sort of combined. They're based on Dylan, Rust, and Racket. Um, from Dylan, we took this idea of a skeleton tree, a way of sort of having an S expression-like data structure that represents the syntax. And that's what we're looking at more or less here. It, it would actually, the actual data structure is going to have um, source location information in it as well, um, similarly to racket syntax objects. Um, but we're not doing a full parse here. We're just doing a sort of structural parse. We're saying there's a name, there's a nested thing, there's another nested thing. Um, here are the, the items inside the nested thing, et cetera. And this is the data structure that macros work on. And then, this is, and then this is also the data structure that eventually gets compiled down into bytecode and, uh, and then jitted um, by the runtime. Other, there are actually three more kinds of macros. One is definition macros. So all these things with at are just macros that call into the compiler. Um, so you can make your own definition macros that define things. They scan until the next new line uh, that's you know, properly nested. Um, there's annotation macros, and this is the sort of extension point where you might add gradual typing. Um, they, they're scheduled with a plus, and they sort of modify the thing that comes on the next line after it. And then finally, we have parsing macros, which instead of receiving syntax objects uh, or skeleton trees, receive a string and are responsible for parsing it out themselves and returning a, a syntax object. And we use these for regexes and for strings. Um, and they scan to the, to the balanced curly. So you can see we can use curlies and regexes here as long as they're well balanced. Um, we have uh, what I'm calling environments, which are dynamic variables. So stack, stack scoped variables, which is a very, very powerful um, refactoring tool to avoid having to thread arguments throughout multiple layers of your system. Um, you can just set a variable, and it will be available in a particular call environment. The variable is scoped to the stack, so as soon as it returns, it's gone. Um, and they're just sigiled with dollar sign. Um, and then we have opt-in lazy evaluation. So Tulip, by default, is, of course, strict. It's side effectful and strict. Um, but if you want to make a thunk, all you got to do is put in a tilde. Tilde means lazy. Um, so here, the first line will not do anything. It'll just make a thunk. Um, and then when, when you pattern match against it or manually force it with a force function, um, it'll force itself and just sort of become the value that it would have um, resolved to um, in, in sort of a weak head normal form kind of way, if you're uh, familiar with Haskell. And so you can use this to make uh, cyclic data structures or infinite, other kinds of infinite data structures um, or just sort of delay uh, evaluation of things that m might not ever get evaluated. Um, how are we doing on time? Two or three minutes? OK, I'll just really quickly skim over this. Um, concurrency, the short story is I copied everything Erlang does. <laughs> I, I, feel like, I feel like they did everything right. So, so, or at least they did it well. So uh, we're just doing exactly the same thing. 
um, including uh, in particular hot code loading. So we're going to support um, safe downtime free deploys. Um, and where your code can opt in to receiving the new code. OK, so I think Tulip is really cool. And it's a unique, promising direction for programming language design. I think um, in, in terms of dynamic languages, having strong pattern matching and guards um, has only really been done in Erlang. And having strong pattern matching and guards with a, with a pleasing syntax and good tooling has not been done before. Um, and you should get involved. Um, some things we need are basic, the, combination, the magic combination of basic C programming and free time. Um, we can't pay anybody right now. Um, we're bootstrapping the compiler front end with Lua. Uh, of course, it's eventually going to all be in Tulip. Uh, we're going to need, in the next couple of months, we're going to need to start really working on the standard library design, which is going to be very, very critical to it being useful at all. Um, if you've got LLVM experience, um, SIG is doing a wonderful job. Um, but is very overworked and <laughs> is going to be starting a job soon. So uh, any, any help we can get is, is good. We need doc writing. Is, Tulip, um, is SNEC open to guys? A SNEC is, is completely open, yeah. Those guys are welcome as long as they're willing to feel like it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, need, we need doc writing. Uh, most a lot of this stuff is sort of in my head and now sort of is is in your heads maybe a little bit um, but having it written down in an approachable way would be really really nice and then finally I would really like to be able to take some time off and work on tulip and for that I would need money so um, I'm probably gonna be posting a patreon link in the next few days um, it'll be posted to the tulip Lang Twitter account um, and anything you can anything you can spare would be helpful um, and it would be a really good opportunity to contribute to something that I think is A, really cool, uh, sort of technically, and B, is potentially transformative for our industry. So that's what I got. Um, do I have time for questions? Nope. OK, so if you have questions, you can meet me afterwards, or you can log on to SNEC. SNEC is open to anyone. Um, but read the code of conduct, of course. Um, that's where you go for SNEC, snec.translunar.space. Um, follow tw Tulip on Twitter. And yeah, I hope to talk to you all soon about it. <laughs>